Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I suspect that you have a sense of what the name of this seminar is and what program it is in. And so the answer is technology, cybersecurity, and policy. Technology, cybersecurity, and policy. One of the and first of all, we're fantastically happy to have Jeff here. Um, this was initiated by a student. Network engineering has been a huge effort for TCT, and stirring around trying to figure out who we could get to talk. Names came up, and Jeff's name came up. And we were fantastically pleased and happy that he said yes to an email. He responded. And guess what? He's here. And he is going to tell us about data centers, the evolution of data center architecture. And please, everyone, thank and welcome Jeff to Technology Cybersecurity Policy. Thank you. Jeff. OK. Um, it's interesting talking about network engineering because TCP means something entirely different to me. But, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, we'll get past that. Um, yeah, I was gonna. I was just gonna say if we turned that front light, okay. there we go. Yeah, most of my slides are in white, and so they'll show up. But just in case. Um, so yeah, my, my whole background is uh, not in cybersecurity, uh, but in network engineering. Um, uh, okay. okay. So I think. No, no, uh, thank you. By the way, that's the, the voice. No, that's this one. So if you do the middle switch, maybe the middle switch. middle switch. How's that? Does that work? Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Sorry, Jeff. Okay. So, um, yeah, I've been in uh, network engineering for uh, many, many, many years. And uh, I've written some books in the area just to give you a little background on me. Um, probably uh, the, one of my books that's uh, most well known is called Routing TCP IP, which I think is actually used in at least one of the classes here, um, the one taught by Kevin Epperson. Um, and he, he and I have known each other for years and years. Um, but I, through my career, at least since the uh, early 1990s, have always kind of chased whatever the new and really interesting things are that are happening in network security. Uh, back in the 1990s, that was uh, IPv6. And I spent a lot of time traipsing around Japan and South Korea and China and Taiwan uh, talking about IPv6 because at that time they were the only ones that really cared about it. Um, but around 2000, a few years before that, a few years after that, uh, what was really exciting in the area of uh, network engineering was all happening in the wide area network, uh, specifically in telcos um, and in service provider networks. And the excitement was around the technology of MPLS, multi-protocol labeled switching. Um, and you might have heard some buzzwords from back then, like uh, triple play networks. Uh, you never really hear that anymore because everybody does that. But the whole idea back then with MPLS was that you could virtualize your networks and then consolidate your networks into this MPLS cloud. Um, so a lot of telcos that had separate um, uh, voice and video and uh, data infrastructures were really interested in MPLS because now they could consolidate that all into one virtualized cloud. And the real secret sauce to MPLS, besides the labeled switching itself, was really under that, which was BGP, which was even back then uh, an old and, and well-proven and very scalable uh, protocol. Um, and one of the key capabilities of BGP was that it was designed uh, to be able to implement very complex policies. Uh, it was also designed to carry a lot of different address families. 
And I'm saying all of that. I mean, with BGP, depending on how you code it, you can pretty much route anything you want. It doesn't have to be IP uh, in BGP. So I'm saying all that because it kind of applies to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, back at that time, like I said, everything was happening in the WAN. Data centers were pretty boring. Uh, it was basically just a big collection of switches, and it had been that way since, um, you know, way back in the, in the 90s when people first started using data centers. Everything is different now. Uh, MPLS is kind of an old, proven technology. Everybody knows MPLS if you're in the network engineering world, um, and there's nothing all that new. What's exciting and new now is actually happening in the data center, starting around 2010, maybe. Um, and so that's where we are. And, um, and I said all of that stuff about MPLS and virtualization and network consolidation and BGP and, and address families because it's all going to come back in these slides. Uh, so to start, and I'm going to brush through these first parts fairly quickly, um, this is kind of what traditional data centers have looked like very simplified drawing that I did here, but uh, this is what traditional data centers have looked like for many years. Uh, you had a three-tier architecture. Uh, down at the bottom is just access switches, which uh, in a data center or top of, top of rack switches, um, you know, and they're connecting to racks of servers below them, which is where you get all your services. Above that was the aggregation or distribution layer, which was typically big, expensive uh, chassis-based switches. And above that is the core layer, which is typically where uh, layer two to layer three handoffs occur. You can do L2 to L3 at the aggregation layer, but many people do at the core layer. It just depends on how it's designed. The problems with this came in not so much that this wasn't a good design for its time, it's what has happened and what data centers do since then. Um, so one of the first problems, maybe the key problem with this architecture is that it was designed really for north-south traffic. In other words, traffic coming into the data center and going out of the data center, about 80% of traffic um, was north-south. And um, oversubscription on the links was maybe anywhere from 64 to 1 to 200 to 1. Um, and latency among uh, the services was non-deterministic. Uh, latency tended to vary a lot. And scaling was very expensive. As you scale out, adding more and more racks to your data center, you have to add more and more of these uh, uh, distribution layer switches, large, again, expensive chassis-based switches. The, what started happening that was different in this architecture, again, is the services. Uh, rather than 80% north-south traffic, we started having 80% east-west traffic, traffic within the services in the data center itself. And that was because of the kind of things that were happening uh, with your web services, you know, and you see that now if you go to your Facebook page or Google Maps or Netflix or any of those kinds of things, it's not just going to a server and collecting what you need and pulling that out. It's, it's spawning a whole lot of stuff behind the scenes to put together that web page that you see, right? Um, so there's a lot of traffic going on across the data center here to give you uh, what you need. You know, you're not just, you know, a different example, you're not just retrieving your email anymore. Um, so that became a, a big problem because this just doesn't scale well for that kind of thing. We have variable latency, um, which means, for example, you know, from one point to another point going east-west, you might have this, you might have something like this, my drawings are kind of terrible here. Uh, if you're going between VLANs, you might have to go up to a layer three uh, gateway and back down. So this latency is very unpredictable within the data center. Um, this can matter a lot, uh, particularly in high performance compute applications. Um, some, uh, for example, financial trading 
uh, data centers where literally microseconds make a difference. Um, and this just doesn't work anymore. Uh, tromboning traffic. If you're trying to go from one VLAN to another, you might have to go all the way up uh, to your layer three gateway just to come back down uh, to the same switch. Um, if you have some really broken forwarding, you might even get something weird, you know, that happens like this to get from one service to another. Uh, so very suboptimal uh, traffic forwarding. Um, down at the uh, access layer, uh, things are very unscalable. Uh, as the data center grows, your forwarding information bases become huge. Um, and, and I'll come back to this, you have a very limited number of VLANs. Um, the VLAN space in the uh, Ethernet 802.1Q header is uh, the VLAN ID is just 12 bits, which means you have a maximum of 4,096 uh, possible VLANs. The, what we'll see as we get into what data centers look like now, there's just no way that that works. Um, and so that became a liability. Um, yep. Yes. So this is the picture before this 2010? Is, uh, circa 2010. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these are, and you still find these. I mean, you know, there's still data centers being built like this. Um, some of it just depends on, you know, what you're wanting the data center for. If you have simple needs, this might be good enough. So um, above that, wherever your layer two, layer three boundaries are, you um, have a tremendous amount of what's, you know, I'm sure everybody knows the term bum traffic. It means broadcast, um, un, uh, unknown uh, unicast and multicast, bum traffic, uh, which basically means with basic listening and learning um, uh, layer two forwarding like we've done forever, you have to broadcast uh, unknown traffic out to discover uh, where they exist. Uh, at layer three, tremendous amount of ARP and IPv6 uh, NDP, neighbor discovery protocol traffic. Um, uh, virtual machine mobility has become a big issue. Uh, you are building all these virtual machines within servers and you want to be able to move those depending on how you're uh, engineering your data center, how you're doing orchestration in your data center, uh, that doesn't work real well in this kind of architecture. And then the final thing is uh, span entry protocol, which has been around for ages, and everybody hates it, um, because you try to build a lot of redundancy into your uh, network, and span entry protocol can block up to 50% of your links to avoid loops. Um, so uh, what we kind of want to avoid needing spanning tree is to build topologies that just don't have any loops. Um, and that gets us up to where we're going now. Uh, the first step here is to look at uh, underlay protocols, uh, sorry, underlay um, uh, architectures. And starting with a guy named Charles Klo who worked for Bell Labs. Um, he was an engineer there, and people don't actually know that much about him, but, um, uh, but back in 1952, he, was, he came up with a new design for crossbar switches in telephony networks, um, and they were called CLO networks. Some people to this day call them CLOS. That's fine if you want to call it CLOS. Um, but, <laughs> When we were looking at data center architectures, we were looking at these cross, uh, crossbar architectures and saying, well, you know, where he's doing these telephony switches, we could build the same thing, replacing these with Ethernet switches. The key uh, piece of this is that for switches coming in, every one of these incoming switches uh, is connected to every midpoint switch, and every midpoint switch is connected to every outgoing switch. Um, and I'll get into why that matters. But um, what this means is, you know, on how do you pronounce cloths? Well, the easiest way is to pronounce it spine and leaf uh, because that's what we really get. We go from uh, these tree architectures to 
a two-tier CLO architecture. And that's really how people are building uh, data center underlays these days. So looking at this specific to data centers, um, we have this idea of a three-stage folded CLO network. Uh, and you can say the same thing as you saw in this picture, except with Ethernet switches now, where every uh, incoming switch is connected to every spine switch. These are leaf switches, spine switches, and then every spine switch is connected to every leaf switch. What's important to notice about this is that this is drawn according to the traffic direction. In other words, all the, in, all the uh, interfaces here are for incoming traffic. It goes here and then everything over here is outgoing traffic. Um, and so ingress, egress, and this is the reason they call it a, flow, uh, a folded flow architecture is that you can actually fold this thing because these switches and these switches are actually the same switches. It's just given from the perspective of egress and ingress traffic. So looking at a CLO architecture, and I'm emphasizing this because it's a point of confusion for a lot of people, a three-stage folded CLO architecture is also a two-tier spine and leaf architecture. It's the same thing. All we've done is taken this and folded it together, right? So now we've got our leaf switches, we've got our spine switches. What's really important to notice about this is that from any leaf switch, I can go just through one spine to get to any other leaf switch. My latency through this is always the same. It never varies. Um, so, key point at this. Um, the other piece is, and, and we'll get into this a little bit further on, but we can do load balancing across all of these, um, these uh, links from one to another. So, um, so non-looping, load balancing here. Um, what this actually looks like, uh, just sort of a different picture of the same thing is how we actually scale this. Typically, um, in a spine leaf network, you'll have four spine switches. You might have six, you might have two, but typical is four uh, at the scaling limits. And then you might have up to 48 uh, leaf switches. The determining factors here for leaf the number of leaf switches is how many interfaces you have on your spine switches, right? And, uh, typically, people will buy spine switches with 48 ports. So you can have up to 48 leaf switches because they're connecting down to it, right? Um, how many spine switches you have depends on how many uplinks you have on your leaf switches, uh, typically four. So hence, you know, that becomes the limiting factor for your spine switches. Links in here uh, can be anything from 10 gig to 40 gig to 100 gig, people are actually starting to see switches coming out at 200 and 400 gig. There's talk of 800 gig, uh, that's still, I don't think anybody actually makes an 800 gig, 400 gig is just starting to come onto the market. But um, those are the kind of links there. Uh, down uh, stream from the leaf switches connected to servers, typically is uh, one or 10 gig. Um, so, Spines bounded by the number of leaf switch uplinks. Uh, leaves bounded by the number of uh, spine ports. Um, and you know, so you're building maybe up to 48. And typically in this kind of architecture, for redundancy, you have two uh, leaf switches at each server rack. So 48 leaf switches means pretty much you can scale out to 24 uh, server racks. And yes, yeah, I'm sorry to keep doing this. Are no, those fine. optimal numbers in any sense? I mean, 48 seems sort of arbitrary. Four seems sort of arbitrary. Um, and then you've also mentioned um, 400 gig. And, and I mean, so, so are, are we doing some modeling that says these are good numbers or 
How do I think about this? I would assume the switch manufacturers uh, have, and more than likely it's, it's uh, based on uh, silicon capabilities in the switches. For when you're actually building these, it's mainly because uh, your um, leaf and spine switches are going to be 48 port switches. You know, could be more, could be less. Could have 24 port switches. You could have uh, 96 port switches. Seems like most people buy 48 port switches. That also have will have four uplink ports. Um, All right, when you say 48 port, then is that for the folded implementation 24 each way? Then, or is it 48? 48 each way, yeah, because you'll uh, it's usually fiber links, could be uh, copper, but usually fiber links, so uh, you know you have transmit and receive side, and so you you get whatever the bandwidth is you chose, whether it's uh, you know one gig, 10 gig, 100 gig, it's going to be each way. Uh, the other part in here is um, the support for oversubscription that you get with this. Uh, depending on you know how many servers you have down here, um, you know if you have uh, say 48 um, 10 gig uplinks from your servers, then you need a capacity of 480 gig, obviously. And you know if so, you choose your uplinks based on that. The question is, I mean, this is going to uh, 24 racks will uh, will serve small to moderate sized data centers. What happens if your data center grows beyond the limits of what you can get here with 48 lift, leaf switches or um, uh, 24 racks? You can expand that three-stage CLO architecture to a five-stage CLO architecture. Um, and your 48 um, leaf uh, architectures here becomes a pod, so you have pod one, pod two, and then you have a super spine connecting that. And what I've shown here is sort of the same thing in the middle. Your spine switches here, uplink to four super spines, uh, where everything is connected to everything, and the same going out. Uh, and again, five stage, simply because you're tracing traffic hops in and out, so you know one, two, three, four, five hops, uh, you know, going across the super spine. And what this looks like, uh, if you fold it up, might look something like this. So you have a, a three-tier uh, spine and leaf architecture where each pod, you have this spine and leaf, and then you have a super spine up there. And you'll notice my, co my connections that I've depicted are a little different. I don't have every spine switch connected to every super spine switch. The implication there is there's a lot of different ways you could start building super spine networks. This is just one. Um, the question is, how much can you scale this? Well, here's an example. That looks horrible. Um, <laughs> and you know, here we have a bunch of pods, and we actually have different spine planes. And if you look at the numbers up there, if these are 48 port downlink switches, we could have up to 48 spine switches in each uh, spine plane. And connected down, you know, if you've got 40 up, 48 up here, then you could have up to 48 pods, each one of which has 48 leaf switches going down to uh, servers. This looks a little absurd, but what this is, is my drawing of the Facebook uh, data center architecture in Altoona, uh, Iowa. Uh, that's, that's what they came up with for this massively scaling data center. Their actual drawing is here. Um, they put it into 3D, uh, so these spine planes are sort of turned sideways from individual pods, and uh, it scales massively. Um, what was I going to say about that? Oh, one of the great things about Facebook, whatever you think about the social media <laughs> site, is that Facebook, their engineering attitude is, we're a social media company. We don't care if anybody knows how we actually design our networks. So, you know, here it is. Here's how we did it. Um, they actually have some new designs out now, but uh, they're very open about 
how they designed their data centers. It's a pretty cool source of, source of knowledge. Um, question on this is, if you're leaving everything just at layer two, where switches are just doing, um, uh, you know, filtering and forwarding and learning, um, this doesn't really scale at all. Um, I mentioned earlier, VLAN IDs uh, are 12 bits, so you're limited to uh, uh, 4,000 plus or minus VLANs. Uh, you have a huge amount of bum traffic in something like this. You would have huge MAC to IP uh, mapping tables. And in fact, you know, that's just on this little simple drawing here. Imagine trying to do that here. You would basically, you know, you'd have a big mushroom cloud, I guess. Um, it just, you know, layer two switching doesn't work here. So this is the underlay, but what we need now is an overlay uh, technology to go with this. And that's where virtual extensible LAN comes in, VXLAN. There's uh, several predecessors to VXLAN, but this is pretty much what people are building data centers with now. If you look at what this, this is a VXLAN packet, if you will, what we're actually doing is taking the entire Ethernet uh, frame and we're encapsulating it, we're putting a VXLAN header on it, but then we're encapsulating it in UDP, IP UDP. So now we have a routable tunnel proto tunneled protocol. Um, some uh, particular, let's see, what are some details in here? UDP port is 4789, that's the VXLAN port in UDP. Um, the uh, virtual network identifier for VXLAN, a VNI, is 24 bits. It's right here, which means you have the capability of well over 16 mi million uh, virtual networks with, uh, with uh, this technology. Notice that you still got in the encapsulated Ethernet frame here, you still got your 802.1Q header, uh, which is you know, your regular VLAN header. So you actually map VLANs to VNIs. Um, leveraging IP networks, uh, so you have things like uh, equal cost multipath, uh, you have loop avoidance that's built into the routing protocols. Um, you can do a lot of reliable network isolation. So if you're doing multi-tenant um, data centers, you can isolate one user from another. And um, in leaf and spine networks, oh, backing up to here, spines don't have to know any of that stuff. All, all of the VXLAN encapsulation and decapsulation and discovery is happening down here all the spines have to do is route IP uh, packets. So you have a lot of scalability at that level, at the control plane. Um, this is sort of a very simplistic depiction that I drew of uh, VXLAN in the forwarding plane. Um, you have you know, your individual uh, virtual machines in servers still connected to VLANs, but you're bringing your L3 um, boundary, L2, L3 boundary, down into the switches, which is network-based VXLAN, you could actually also push this all the way down to the servers and have host-based VXLAN, or you could do a combination of both and have hybrid VXLAN. But these things map to what's called a virtual tunnel endpoint, a VTEP, which is VXLAN, that has some associated IP address and then you just have tunnels, and everything is forwarded over these VNIs. Um, just checking my time here. Ooh, 4:30. Um, this works pretty well, but there's still drawbacks. Um, if, based on the original VXLAN uh, architectures, you still had what was called uh, uh, flood and learn, FNL traffic, where if I don't know how to reach from this uh, VM to some other VLAN, uh, VM somewhere on the network, I still had to flood uh, discovery traffic out to find uh, where that other VM 
resided. So that's still uh, in the control plane, doesn't scale well. Um, an intermediate um, step in this uh, to, to modify that problem was to build all of this on multicast so that uh, you could have well-known multicast addresses that at least limit some of the flood, flood and learn traffic. And, uh, but the problem is, if you, if you start asking users to build multicast networks, that becomes prohibitive simply because it's another complexity in your network. Uh, you know, the multicast, IP multicast networks are basically PIM-SM networks. Um, you know, you've got to configure rendezvous points, um, all kinds of, you know, some kind of a PIM uh, architecture um, and multicast routing protocols, all that kind of stuff. Nobody really wanted to do that, so that's, that's a bit prohibitive too. Um, and that's a bit here that starts moving to, you know, we've got this first virtual, a virtualized forwarding layer on top of the underlay, but the control plane of it doesn't scale well. Uh, first two things here, I talk about flood and learn and uh, L3 multicast. You can, because this is routable, you can route it with any routing protocol, but the problem is that uh, IGPs like OSPF and ISIS, EIGRP, uh, don't have any si signaling capabilities. They don't have the capability of building any kind of policies. Uh, they don't scale well if you start getting a huge network. So where do we go from here? Well. The answer to that, going along with VXLAN, is a thing called Ethernet Virtual Private Networks, or eVPNs, which is BGP-based. Um, this is why I kind of started with the whole thing with MPLS and virtualized networks, uh, virtualization of networks, and BGP, because now we're going back to BGP again, and we're getting this hugely scalable uh, control plane. Um, you remember I talked about uh, BGP supports multiple address families. So uh, you can route um, uh, more than just IP. You know, you can do tunnels, which in this case are layer two and layer three VPNs, um, which could be created for isolation, and BGP will, will uh, route that just fine. Um, and what you have are, uh, in BGP called VRFs, or virtual routing and forwarding tables, that are shared uh, between um, endpoints. And um, don't really worry about route targets and, and uh, route discriminators. It's sort of some of the uh, secret sauce behind multi-protocol BGP that makes it work. But, uh, you know, but you've got the same support with uh, eVPNs. And here's sort of uh, I mean, this is, this is tremendously simplistic, but, uh, but what you've got here, instead of the um, listening and learning that you would have had before, which is kind of passive, I'm just listening to see if anybody wants to know about any of the MAC addresses that I'm connected to, I'm actively advertising. Um, you know, I'm VTEP 10.0.0.3, and uh, I have these particular MAC addresses connected to me. Everybody else can hear that, build their forwarding tables, and you don't have you know, this huge amount of bomb traffic uh, going through your uh, eVPN network. So um, let's see, I'm trying to remember what, oh yeah, so the next question uh, again is, well, how much does this scale? Um, what I've given you through all of this, because we just got an hour here, is um, a very high level overview of how we virtualize traffic uh, and virtualize networks within a data center. But the thing is, operations at this point don't scale. What I've given you uh, about uh, eVPN VXLAN is actually a tremendously complex configuration. Um, so if you have you know, people in your, in your data center trying to change these things and configure these things on a daily basis, your uh, human error is going to basically skyrocket. Um, and if you have a multi-vendor environment, 
those problems become even more because now you're having to do these configurations in possibly multiple operating systems. Um, in a data center, large data centers, the big players there are generally either, uh, and operating systems are gonna be Cisco NXOS, uh, Arisa EOS, uh, Cumulus Linux, or Juniper Networks Junos. It's usually gonna be one of those four. There are other uh, switch vendors, but those are kind of the big main players in uh, data center switching. And so, you know, if you happen to have multi-vendor networks with all of them in there, uh, you know, which might also include things like uh, Facebook's FBOSS and some other things like that, you know, you have to have people that know how to, uh, how to uh, configure in all of those different um, formats, which again, leads to a lot of human error. So where we go beyond that, is uh, potentially soft, uh, software-defined networks. Um, just sort of looking, I, I debated whether to even include this slide, but if you look at traditional big chassis-based switches, you have a bunch of line cards that all have Ethernet interfaces on them, and you have a supervisor engine, which is basically the control plane. Um, and that's all connected by a backplane, right? And you can kind of think of whatever the proprietary protocol that allows all of these line cards to communicate with the supervisor uh, engine as being kind of closed flow with, uh, and this goes back to you know, 2010, 2012 in there. Um, and I believe it was out of uh, Stanford, may have been UCLA, no, it was Stanford. Um, they started looking at a protocol called OpenFlow, where you actually, uh, with uh, SDN, early concepts of SDN, you pop the uh, control plane off completely and um, the control plane communicated with uh, the forwarding plane through OpenFlow. Uh, so you have, you know, basically something like this. You have still your leaf switches, here's your CLO architecture, uh, you know, spine switches, then you have SDN controllers above that and that's your control plane. So, um, you know, here's how this sort of fits to traditional chassis switches. You know, supervisor uh, becomes SDN controllers, backplane becomes spine switches, um, line cards become leaf switches. Uh, this is an early idea of SDN. And uh, there's still companies around. There's one company called Big Switch uh, that actually builds and sells this whole idea here with uh, SDN controllers, they sell their own switches and everything and you plug that all in and their concept is, you know, we make your data center look like one big switch. It's the name of the company. So um, that's sort of the, the uh, first ideas around SDN. But, uh, you know, what is it really and what does it mean nowadays? Uh, you'll still hear this joke, SDN stands for still does nothing, because SDN started becoming a really great marketing buzzword. Uh, everybody was claiming to have it, everybody was claiming to do it, uh, but what does it really mean? Um, and, and it's sort of, a lot of people have avoided it. Um, I am helping some friends write a book right now on uh, network programmability, and I looked through uh, their outline and said to them, well, you don't have a chapter in there on SDN. And they were like, oh no, SDN, nobody, everybody will laugh at us, nobody knows what SDN is anymore, you know, it's, uh, that's just marketing. And, uh, you know, then you start looking at what they're actually outlining and it's like, well, this is all SDN. Um, so, what everybody kind of thinks of SDN is this definition. Uh, the SDN is a layer two, layer three architecture in which a centralized controller uh, controls the forwarding behavior of distributed switches. In other words, you have a distributed forwarding plane, centralized control plane. Um, that may or may not be what SDN is anymore. Um, I wrote a book with some friends a while back and I came up with this definition that I still like. Uh, and it fits a lot more of what we do now. That SDN is a conceptual framework in which networks are treated as abstractions and are controlled programmatically with minimum direct touch of individual network components. And that last piece is really key. 
you're not really touching your switches anymore. You're operating your network through the SDN controller. You're only talking to the controller, and the controller takes care of actually configuring switches. Um, so uh, objectives, you know, so, uh, the promises of SDN are a lot different from what you might actually get. But uh, this first bullet up here, single plane of glass, that's, that's definitely a buzzword you hear all the time. Uh, but, you know, it's really what I just described while ago. And by the way, this drawing over here is kind of old, um, but uh, it comes from seaplane. But I just always like this drawing, so I threw it in there. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, know, you get the idea of, of uh, zero touch provisioning. You plug in new switches into your network, and the SDN controller takes care of, of uh, bringing the switch up and, and configuring it. Uh, you have programmability and automation, integration with orchestration kind of shown up here at the top. Um, you have a lot less human error because you're defining policies. What you're actually doing here is building a virtualized topology, a model of the network. Uh, SDN is talking to all the stuff, gathering all that information, and you're doing all your operations on this model that then goes through policy controls. Uh, so you're only configuring your network uh, according to what's compliant in your policy controls. And, um, and using you know, best practices. You're not having people on the CLI typing out commands anymore. So that's SDN. Kind of uh, what's next uh, beyond SDN. Um, this is something I thought of back, I don't know, about 2011 in some presentation where I was trying to talk about what's next. And I was talking about SDN at the time. And I said, well, maybe beyond SDN is application uh, defined networks. Um, and the idea was that you have applications that you want to add to your network. You have some arbitration and orchestration engine in this thing. You're gathering from your SDN or Network Functions Virtualization Controller, NFV Controller, network intelligence. So arbitration knows what's what resources are available in your network, what the network is doing at that particular moment. Your applications are also telling uh, the, orchestra the arbitration layer, I need these resources in order to operate in the network. Um, and out of that, we do arbitration and we actually configure the network through the SDN controller. Um, that was just my guess. Um, what has come out of that that's, that's very similar to this, I'm, I'm a little proud of this because I really was just it was kind of clueless guessing as to, as to next steps here. But what's coming out of this is now pretty much called intent-based networking. Um, and the idea, that's what we've got here. Um, right now, you express uh, business or technical intent. Here's what I need for my network to do. And you have basically human middle, middleware, uh, network architects, that you express this to, they turn your intent into actual configurations and deploy that out to the network, right? Let's see if my automation work, uh, works here. What intent-based networking does is add algorithmic uh, middleware um, to translate that intent directly into network configurations. Um, the network architect doesn't go anywhere they're still there, but they're monitoring all of this instead of being an active part of sort of the mundane parts of configuring networks. Um, the example I like to use, uh, I read somewhere that um, a Boeing 777 aircraft, pilots uh, say that on the average, they spend about seven minutes of every flight manually flying the plane. The rest of the time, automation takes care of it. Doesn't mean that you don't have the pilot in the uh, cockpit telling the automation what to do uh, and what they want, expressing their content and monitoring everything. And that becomes sort of the same idea here with intent-based networking. Um, so this is sort of a really vague idea of an intent-based networking system. Uh, IBN is a system which an operator expresses a business or technical intent, and the system uses machine learning, another big buzzword, uh, and closed loop telemetry to configure and run the network. Um, 
I was putting all, I put all these slides together this past weekend, and uh, last night a friend of mine on social media uh, said, um, she, she was saying, well, I've got to do this presentation tomorrow, and uh, I'm going to propose a drinking game anytime someone says machine, machine uh, <laughs> learning or artificial intelligence, you have to take a drink. And uh, I thought, well, great. And I just mentioned uh, machine learning in mind. But uh, nevertheless, that's what it does, um, whether you want to call it that or not. So you know, out of this definition, well, um, what does that really mean? Well, there's, there's three different views here. Uh, there's kind of a contextual view. You know, here's what I need. This, I'm expressing um, you know, what my business objectives are. There's an intent view. Well, what do I do about what I need? And there's a prescriptive uh, view, which is how do I do it? That's kind of what you want to get out of that arbitration engine, right? Um, so a quote from Chuck Robbins, uh, CEO of Cisco, uh, from a, a couple of years ago, says, we're ushering in a new era of networking that's powered by intent, there's that word, informed by context, there's that word, and over time continues to adapt and learn. Uh, this is sem a seminal moment in networking. Uh, Cisco is buying heavily into um, intent-based networking. They're a big player there. Uh, others to pay attention to are uh, forward networks and uh, the place where I actually work right now, which is called Abstra. Um, <coughs> and there's a lot of other vendors out there that claim to be doing intent-based networking. But those are kind of the big players right now. Um, and Cisco, by the way, calls theirs, because Cisco really loves having their own terms, calls it the network intuitive. Uh, and I like that term. I, you know, it really kind of says what's happening. The network has some ideas about what it's doing and knows what you expect of the network, and it adapts itself. And it you know, adapts and learns, as Chuck Rahman said. So uh, cool term. Um, anyway, out of this, how do, we make it, how, do, how do you make that work? How do you make intent-based networking work? Well, you have telemetry and data gathering. You have analytics, uh, APIs, um, and some shared language. Um, network automation, of course, and there's that word machine learning again. Um, and that's um, intent-based networking systems. Um, and I, I should say, I, I sort of led the whole lecture to intent-based networkings and then said, well, I work for Abstra. Uh, oh, uh, um, product placement. Um, I'm not pointing the lecture to intent-based networking because I work at Abstra or work for one of the companies doing all this stuff. I'm rather working for one of the companies that's doing all this stuff because I, I feel like this is where networking is going and that's where the fun is going to be over the next few years. There's a long way to go. Uh, intent-based networking is really in its infancy. Um, when we talk about expressing intent, I think somewhere in a few slides here I talked about business intent. We're nowhere near doing that. Um, it's really expressing technical intent right now. Uh, but as we learn, as we progress, I think we'll get to a point where we're actually expressing um, business intent. And all of these arbitration layers, the, um, the algorithms, take care of the rest of it. Um, so this is a drawing that I really like. Uh, Gardner did this a couple of years ago. Um, and it's just their idea. You're expressing intent into this. And you have some intent engine built around algorithms. Um, that intent, intent engine informs uh, your automation, uh, orchestration, configuration layer and pushes configurations down to the actual network components. Network components uh, put state, <coughs> excuse me, state back into a, a state data store and you have a closed loop telemetry here that provides real-time validation of your intent. It knows what your intent is and you know constantly checks is the network still meeting the expressed content and if not it can either adjust the network or it can, uh, can um, raise anomaly alarms to you, saying, you know, the network is ha has this problem and your intent is not really there anymore. Um, so, cool uh, picture there. And I'm, I'm amazed I actually got through this in time to still leave room for questions. Uh, this, what I gave you is I just blasted through. <laughs> 
a lot of uh, what's happening in uh, data center architectures right now and, and where I see data center architectures going. There's a lot of stuff I didn't even mention. Um, didn't talk much, uh, well, didn't talk at all about the move to merchant silicon, moving, moving away from uh, custom-built ASICs. Um, didn't talk about uh, programmable silicon. Um, heard someone speak just a few weeks ago and made a prediction that within 10 years, all switches will have programmable silicon in them. Uh, it's still sort of uh, you know on the cutting edge right now. So there's a lot of other things happening, but it all seems to be happening in the data center. So, um, and by the way, most any of these topics that I talked about uh, could easily be covered in a couple of uh, two-hour lectures uh, instead of this, this really quick overview that I gave, and in some cases, very simplistic overview. But uh, at that point, I actually did manage to get through it with about 10 minutes left. Um, so are there questions? And by the way, if you, have, if you think of questions later, uh, my email address and my phone number is there on that slide. Please feel free to take advantage of it. I'm always happy to hear from people. And uh, yes. So before we have a first question, please let's thank our speaker. Oh, thank you. Long overview of data centers, networks, et cetera. Questions, please. Very broad overview. Yes. Couple in the back. Please. Yeah, um, so as far as the algorithmic middleware um, that, that sort of automatically trans, translates into network configurations, has anybody um, like implemented and rolled that out fully, or is this still something that people are, are looking into? Um, sort of um, in between, probably the beginnings of that. Um, I uh, am actually, over this last week, I've been working with some programmers at my company um, uh, to, uh, to do exactly that. Um, well, in fact, that's, that's what Appster does completely, but uh, as does Cisco, and I, I don't want to uh, uh, spend too much time talking about one specific <coughs> company, but, but uh, what they all do is, is you know, basically say, for example, I need a uh, VXLAN tunnel, you know, at these particular points, you know, with these particular parameters, uh, that goes into the algorithms that then push out configurations uh, depending on what uh, systems are below it. So, you know, if it's in XOS or EOS or Cumulus Linux or Junos, it'll push out, uh, it knows what switch uh, or what switches are attached and will push out configurations specific to those switches. So you never actually touch the switches themselves and you don't have to do any uh, specific, um, you know, any, yeah. any operating system specifics for yeah, that. That's really cool. Um, yeah, and that's, and that's been done now. That's interesting. So is that being done now? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's productized by... Uh, Cisco, for example, uh, Cisco ACI uh, does exactly that. You express, you know, the policies you want in your network. Um, our product does that. I actually don't know that much about forwarding networks, but, you know, they, they uh, are doing a lot with intent-based networking, too, and I assume they do a lot of the similar stuff. And that's, and that's really the, the key to, to the whole thing, is being able to, to just generically express what you want your network to do and sort of have you know, ready to go, best practice configurations come out the other end. Yes, sir. So you talked about uh, SDN in the data center, so like transferring all the like management thing to the controller, don't you think it's opened up a big security hole? Um, can, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, so like uh, we are uh, with the SDN in the data center, we are transferring the control plane to the uh, like a centralized controller, right? So don't you think it's opening a big security hole? In the network, oh. like if controller goes down or someone takes care, like control of it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, how, how can uh, we... that, that's a big concern, um, you know, and and that's that's a good example of where I, you know, made a real simplistic drawing there. Uh, you actually don't want to have just a centralized one SDN controller. You actually want to have controller clusters, and depending on how you know what the span of your network is, probably you know, have your, have your clusters in more than one place, and they should be talking to each other to, yeah. to synchronize what they're doing. 
And like, Which uh, is not that different from what, uh, you know, all the control planes, if you look right now on switches and routers, all the control planes, especially routers, obviously, the control planes are, that's exactly what they do. They all talk to each other to, um, to uh, synchronize what they're, what they're doing. And like uh, most of the, like, let's say data centers, like generally devices like won't support, like maybe open flow or any kind of southbound protocols, and they will need like a four, four click up upgrade for their devices. So what do you think will be the best practice for them to transition towards the SDN? Because data center, I, I think uh, ultimately will be going towards SDDC, like software defined data center. So mm -hmm. what do you think will be the best practice for the transition? Um, I think uh, OpenFlow has probably, it's still kind of out there. Uh, I mentioned the company Big Switch. Uh, they, they actually use a um, sort of a modified version of OpenFlow to communicate from their controllers to, to the switches and the switches can, uh, you know, give information to the controllers. But it doesn't really scale well. Uh, there's limits to that. Uh, so if you start you know, massively scaling your data center, OpenFlow is way too chatty. Um, it's, um, um, it's, I think, an older and now kind of obsolete protocol. And, uh, you know, if you're looking at something like EVPN, uh, you know, you have, it's much more scalable, much less chatty. It's really just behaving the way BGP behaves in the internet. And, uh, yes? Um, how do you see data centers working with 5G? Uh -huh. um, you know, I have been so deep in data center architecture, I have not really um, studied 5G well at, at an architectural level. Um, I do know that one of the key components that's going to happen with 5G and is already uh, is also happening with 4G networks, uh, and I mentioned it just really fast, was network functions virtualization, NFV, uh, which is, again, I could do a whole lecture on, on just NFV, but what uh, that comes from is uh, primarily telcos looking at what was happening in the, in the data centers with SDN and such, uh, and all kinds of uh, functions virtualization, you know, virtualized firewalls and all that sort of thing, and saying, we want to be able to pull that into the wide area network. Um, and one of the big applications they saw was in mobile networks. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, T-Mobile, for example, is really, really big into uh, NFV, um, being able to build a lot of their... Uh, network controllers and that kind of thing on servers rather than having to have dedicated hardware for it, uh, which allows a lot of flexibility and all that sort of thing. So I feel like I'm kind of talking around your answer, uh, trying to talk around my ignorance, <laughs> but, uh, um, but uh, um, I think that data center, the trends in data centers is probably going to have a lot more influence on how 5G networks are built rather than the other way around. Yes. Are large companies like Facebook moving away from the three-tier network hierarchy? Um, Completely away. Well, not just for the data centers, but oh. for like, you know, you know, 100 is finance, 200 is HR, 300 is R&D. Um, are they also moving away from that core distro access model for non-data center networks? Um, for companies like Facebook, I you know, on that end, which is really more kind of like the enterprise side of things, um, I think that those concepts are still there, uh, but they're they're being implemented uh, more efficiently. Uh, but you know, if you're if you're just looking at um, enterprise networks in general, um, I think there's a lot more leeway on how those things can be built. You know, whether it's building our campus or, you know, or spread out over the wide area uh, than what you have in the data centers where, you know, performance uh, and such matter so much more. A uh, big part, in fact, I think I had a slide originally and then deleted it trying to cut the fat out of the presentation, but uh, um, one of the things that, uh, that's significant is back when three-tier types of data centers were being built. Data centers were just kind of a tool of the business. Uh, what's really evolved now on the business view of that is data centers really are the business now. 
um, and you know, and, and all of the operations tend to be built around it, um, which I don't think answers your question completely. But uh, no, you uh, but uh, but yeah, I think I think there's a lot more design leeway on the enterprise side than there right. is in the data center. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. In the oh, Arista, I like your I like your Arista shirt. <laughs> So uh, in the intent-based networking you mentioned, <coughs> first it, it will, the intent will go to the orchestration, then orchestration will tell a uh, controller to manage and deploy the virtual machine or whatever the physical network. So in the end you mentioned that it is capturing, uh, using the machine learning, it, it is capturing the data and tell what is the, like intent is correct or not. So what is it capturing? What is like at which part machine learning comes? Like. And what is it doing? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, um, what it's really capturing is is just telemetry from the network. You know, you you actually specify, uh, you know, what do I want to monitor in the network? It's um, if you look at what networks, at the information networks actually give back to you now, it's this gigantic flood of information. So it's not so much what do I want uh, to get from the network? It's more what out of all of this information is really important? And where do I, uh, how do I use, and this is where machine learning comes in, how do I use the intelligence to be able to make connections? You know, I'm seeing uh, this particular um, uh, metric in my network and it's varying in this certain way what does that have to do with all these other metrics and what are all these things together telling me? Um, and um, you know, and that, that's, where the, that's where artificial intelligence and machine learning, and again, um, you know, a lot of people hate using those terms, including a lot of the software uh, engineers in my own company that yell at me when I say things like that. But, uh, but that's really what's happening. Um, you know, you're, you're just doing data analysis. Um, and uh, one of the things out of intent-based networking, uh, networking that is important is not just being able to do day zero and day one, you know, deployment, but, and this is kind of maybe marketing terms too, but uh, moving out into day two, which is just everyday operation of the network and being able to monitor the network and watch when things are changing. Uh, okay. we'll, we'll make question this uh, over here. Question. Okay, uh, we're just a little bit over, so last question. Uh, so with the SDN coming up, do you think that the traditional way of uh, configuring networks and switches will eventually go away? Like all the applications will move to SDN and not oh. use the traditional way of configuration? I think it's going to change. Um, <laughs> The question, uh, if I can repeat it, just to make sure I understood what you're saying, uh, is, is uh, yes, Jim, coming up uh, with the traditional way of configuring networks, will it eventually go away? Will it become up obsolete? That's what I mean. Um, not completely. I, you know, I've been a quote unquote router jockey for for what since the <laughs> late 1980s, um, and you know, so it's. I may be influenced a lot by that because I still get on the CLI, you know, and do configurations and all that sort of thing. Um, and so the question, and by the way, that, that your question arises uh, very commonly. You know, we'll, we get to a point where, you know, there is no more CLI. Um, and my inclination is to say, well, you still got to, you know, build the network, you know, in the beginning and do some kind of configuration on uh, the switches and routers, you know, to at least get them up and running and talking to uh, whatever your control plane is. Um, having said that, you know, that may just be me and the fact that I'm really old. Um, and, you know, the, I think what people are very much thinking about is, well, how do we do that? You know, just come up with switches and routers that we put into our network and we tell the we express intent to the controller, and the controller brings everything up, and we never touch them. Uh, so you know, I think people are thinking about that. We're nowhere near being there, but uh, but yeah, I think people are thinking about that. So please, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Technology, cybersecurity, and policy.
today. Uh, Garrett, would you raise your hand, please? So uh, there's pizza to celebrate. Uh, you have Doyle being here, and uh, you are encouraged to follow Garrett. He will lead you on the path of pizza, as we have heard today a wonderful lecture on data centers, the future, the past, and oh my goodness, uh, yeah, we're all going to job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, again, thank you all for coming. And we have a swag bag for you, sir. And oh, thank I you. I that you have already. Thank you very much. I appreciate and it.